He, he was dying, this is 1981, he was dying of cancer. So I said, I've got to give him something. So I surprised him one night at the club and read this. Well, I don't know what happened. But do you know the man lived 18 more years after he got this poem? <laughs> so I don't claim the poem did it, but I must have helped a little bit. <laughs> OK. Sure. That is the kind of rowdy poem. It must have been something like sheets of sound wrinkled with rips and scats, the action man of a fierce night breezing through the grits and grain, or something like a blind leviathan squeezing through solid rock, marking chaos in the water when his lady of graveyard love went turning tricks on the ocean's bottom, or something like a vision so blazing basic, so gut bucket so blessed, the low out blues flew out. Jam. Jazz to Jackson and Dust to Dodd and Words to Chuck. It must have been something like Sarah Street in the Bebop 40s, a ragtag Holy Ghost baptized in Mississippi on an unexpected Sunday, a brilliant revelation for Billy telling you about these foolish things back in your old backyard. Angel eyes in the rose room, monks changing piano into horn because it was zero in the sun, and around midnight, there was nobody but you to walk Parker and his jazz to Jackson. Yeah, brother. It must have been something striking you like an eargasm, a baritone axe laid into soprano wood. Like loving madly in hurting silence, waiting to finger pop this even air with innovations of classical black at decibels to wake the deaf, the dumb, and the dead. Because around midnight, there was nobody but you who dug whether race records were lamentations or lynchings. Jazz. Jazz to Jackson and sunsets to dawn and words for John. Steal away, steal away, steal away. The heart blow, horn blow, drum drop, the bass five, four time beat, making a one o'clock comeback creep behind all that jazz. Beep, 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 beep. Steal way back to beginning. Beginning is the water, is the soul, is the source of the foundation with my brothers. Is Pharaoh jabbing in the pyramid? Sentence of Spain for a night in Tunisia. Is MJQ, Tatum, Turin, Time, Tyler, the jazz messenger, Messiah's crusading and headhunting, tracking down the mind, cause, Lord, yes, all God's people got sold. And who'd have thought owning rhythm was a crime, like stealing a nickel and snitching a dime when we had coffers packed with golden music in time, golden music in time, sliding from the flesh, the bone, honey sweet music. They're lollipopsicle people. And they sardine chips. And no music to speak of. They stole it all and sold it all for wooden nickels, for frozen dimes, jazz. Behind all that jazz, blues people in the corn, in the veil of cotton tears, blues people in the corn, waiting, 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 waiting in esoteric patience, waiting to steal away, steal away, steal away. Soon as Miles runs down, the Voodoo Avenue with some jazz to Jackson and pipes a private number to call a tune for John. And this John is our new day. Never say goodbye to the blues that saw you through, nor put down the spirituals and the salty sermonettes 
the drugs, the junkies, the jukebox juice, the sweat and the pain of shelling hot peanuts, hot peanuts, jazz. The jazz you gave to us. We give to you as jazz to Jackson. And because we really want to thank you, word for God. very similar to Lawrence, except that there are only two or three bars downtown. But you go there about 8 or 8.30 and the place was dead. So I had to go up 30 miles to San Francisco if I ever really wanted to, uh, to party, to enjoy. And uh, a couple of chance conversations and some personal stuff I'm dealing with right now makes me want to do a couple of things. transcribed it and put it on here. In talking with uh, Shauna, Matt, Greg, and Yao, they brought to mind some places I was back when I was doing that uh, people watching. I used to have to go get right and then go to San Francisco. I could go to San Francisco and then get right. Anybody know what I'm talking about? <laughs> You could have come to Oakland, you know. <laughs> yeah, but them bridges would be kind of tough sometimes. <laughs> you know, I, I did do that quite a bit. Uh, this is called Night's Life, and it's overlaid on the second poem that I would want to do. I haven't had a chance to really do the work and put it on there, but you'll understand. I have kind of a double anniversary coming up, and I don't know whether it's my 30th or my 33rd. So I ask you what you think about that maybe after I read the poem. It's called Night's Life. Half moon, winking eye of eternity. Luna's heavenly smile, cacophony, sirens and alarms, shuffling feet, shuffling feet through jazz clubs, closing doors, running from the devil, blue-suited clowns, nappy heads and dirty faces peep. Storefront churches, jagged, naked panes proclaim their worth to God. Light voices. Heavy bodies and tambourines, green, yellow, red, green, yellow, red. Zombies crowd, sidewalks, elbows, swift, lonely contacts. Mama's down home style kitchen, uncut, the good stuff. Reaper, coke, the bomb, everything is better with coke. Bartenders deal straights and flushes. Scotch and watered down dreams. Impatient cabbies ignore fares and street lights. Yellow, red, green, yellow. Red, green, snake dancers entertain smoke, small and smoke shrouded sequin universe and rooftop lovers walk, don't walk, walk, don't walk. Hey buddy, it's time to go. Well yeah, but I could care less about your wife having an affair, even if it is with another woman. 2 a dreamers, 2 a.m. dreamers and 3 a.m. schemers, midnight smackers and insomniacs throw rays of life into the night. No man, don't need none. Well, it's not none of yours. Back alleyways, nurse nappy winos and cracked heads. Life is life's end the night. Eggshell dawns extend gloomy shadows, embracing a city that is always in darkness. I am Afrocentric. I don't necessarily do normal things with dark and light, so pay attention to this. If you feel the urge to to sing, or let, uh, you, you'll see when it happens, I say, sing, singer, sing, see the light, see the light, see the light. See, I don't sing in church for fear of going to hell. So, so I ask for help and somebody else help me sing. Sing, singer, sing, see the light, see the light, see the light, standing in the darkness, trying to be free. I lived in the light for three years, away from public eyes, private eyes, and norms. Sin singers soul, and sin singers sang, see the light. See the light, see the light. That's why I don't sing. <laughs> like the cracked pipe, there was a learning curve. It made people mad, acting like the methodology of bud or hashish, or even opium. <coughs> Damn, this is good shit. 
That was not the right way to fill your lungs. Not from the cracked pipe. Sin singers sang, see the light, see the light. Be gentle, smooth, slow. Yeah, no, that's a good hit. Sin singers sang, see the light, see the light, see the light. Sin singers soul, you feel the rush? No. Still, the sin singer's soul have another hit after the first high. Nothing mattered too much. But as hard as I tried, I never got back there, never got back to that first good high. So long ago, before crack, there was free base. Anything with free in it has to be good, right? Forgetting about the base part of it, because everything is better than hope. The darkness said escape. So I developed drinking buddies that did not smoke. But I did not like to drink. It was easy to give that up and still the same singer sang, see the light, see the light, see the light. But after the light, there were no more good highs. After the light, lost loves, fickle friends. Days were nightmares and nights were just there. But I learned about the darkness and rode it to real freedom. Rode away from the slavery of a glass-ass pipe. Took a ticket on the cold turkey train. 33 years ago, the weekend after the 4th of July in 1980. So Fred, that's what it means to me. Afrocentric love, Afrocentric life. My father's house, my family sang to me. Sold me on a dark love of blackness, reminded me of loving my dark self, and still the sin singers sing. See the light, see the light, see the light. And I did not trust myself in that three-year-old darkness. And I wanted to know if I took my darkness into the light, which one would win? The sin singers sang, see the light, see the light, see the light. We found the light three years later. The Sin Singers sang in an L.A. jungle alleyway, 1983. The Sin Singers still sang. And lit up in a sunlit studio in West L.A. And the Sin Singers sold again the next day. Sin Singers sang, but did not catch me. Darkness prevailed. One more? Okay. This one is uh, dedicated to uh, all the bakeries in the world <laughs> and the Williams sisters, Venus and Vanessa. <laughs> Venus and Vanessa, Vanessa Williams. They're both sisters, right? Yeah. All right. This one I asked Althea not to get mad at me about it. The first time I saw you, my mind wrapped you in aluminum foil like a Christmas kiss. I went M and M about you, sweet thing. Mad and manly. I saw those mounds and those honey buns. Made me think you could easily be my almond joy. But I was full of snickers when you asked me about payday. <laughs> Baby Ruth, I'd be your sugar daddy, but I know all this other. <laughs> I'm simple, candy-coated, plain, or peanut meat. But you make love such a rocky road. I mean, you won't give me but a little bit of honey. And I want to melt into your, uh, well, well, what you would call it, not just mouth or hands. You see, I'm not one of those nerds. That wants the butterfinger? <laughs> Baby, I want to score. And if you let my bubblegum lips caress your chocolate chips, I swear you want some more. I want M and M about you, sweet thing, because you are truly a star in a sort of chocolate milky way. <laughs> I'm going to read, um, you know, basically family poems. 
starting out, actually starting out with my father and ending up with my father. Um, okay, this is an old poem, a daddy poem. My father's a handsome guy. Looks like a cross between Clark Gable and Ernest Hemingway. If you don't believe me, I got proof. Once a white woman at one of those parties said to my father, you're good looking for a colored man. So I'm gonna read a, a Brooklyn poem. I spend a lot of time in Brooklyn. This is called City Pastoral. Garbage trucks groaning, garbage cans banging, car alarms sounding off, noisy, pushy birds waking me at dawn with their smart ass songs. <laughs> <laughs> I want to do, I get uh, two love poems for my wife over time. They're short. I write other people who write long ones. I write little poems. First one, you look beautiful. The husband says, you look beautiful. Not hearing the wife says, have you seen my glasses? I said you look beautiful. Well, let's find my glasses and we'll see. <laughs> Another one goes back. It's written the last couple of years, but it goes back to college. How we met. Barbara said, "I got to take a shit. Why don't you two get to get to know?" doing a series of poems um, on paintings. I'm trying another series on music, but I'm being less successful about that. Uh, all, all sorts of paintings. Um, and, you know, and it consists of really looking at the paintings, either going to museums or looking at them in books. And the first poem is, is, is for Jacob Lawrence. It's about Jacob, <coughs> Jacob Lawrence. And it's called The Beauty of Barrenness. Jacob Lawrence could paint the beauty of barrenness. Blacks moved north, leaving empty rooms behind them. Lawrence's genius was to paint those rooms left behind. Brown, bare, wooden rooms, light brown plank walls, dark brown plank floors, a single dark green shade covering the window erasing the lush landscape, creating a stark beauty, a simple beauty, a bare beauty. And I'm going to, um, this is a poem dedicated to uh, Romare Bearden. The poem is called The Black Card Players. And they did a beautiful job in producing it. And, and it's, you know, it's, um, well, I'll just read the poem. Bearden's, uh, Bearden's car players in some ways differ from Cezanne's. In Cezanne's, all three men intensely stare at the cards. Their cards their cards are their only world. And Bearden, two card players stare at the other cards intensely. The third vacantly stares out toward us, but not looking at us. His cards flat on the table. Does he have a bad hand, or is he thinking about his father's impending death? And Cezanne, the spectators pay no attention to the game stare off, musing on their own lives. 
and bearded no spectators. A waitress brings a glass of red wine, joy perhaps, but in Bearden's more colorful world, nobody interacts either. All are lost in their own thoughts. And something about the poem, so I'm writing up there and I'm writing about Cezanne, but there is a line about this one card player who says, he doesn't, he, but ha, you know, he's not, his cards are flat on the table, he's not looking at them. Does he have a bad hand or is he thinking about his father's impending death? And this brings up, my father died, uh, it will be two years, uh, two years October, and I have, two poems. Uh, one's called Alzheimer's, which I've been, it's sort of interesting because I've been kind of rewriting these poems recently, I'm, even though I don't know where they're published, I don't know where they're published, because I haven't been keeping up with that. But this is first a poem um, about my father who, who had Alzheimer's um, in the end, but was such a, he was always incredibly charming person and playful. He kept it, even though you know he really didn't know what was going on with him. Um, he um, grew up in Calgary, Canada, so that's that's just something you need to know. And Calgary was this cowboy town. There was the Calgary Stampede, where all these people sort of played cowboys um, once once a year. So Calgary was really important to him. And my father was a jazz drummer. Uh, no, he doesn't like that word. He was a big band drummer. <laughs> uh, so here is the poem about this, 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 this disease and, and about my father. Like in a book, you lose your place. You lose the page in the book of your life. You cannot find the place to put your thumb. One finger looks, one, I'm sorry, one page looks just like another. You look out the window, you wonder, where are you? Two, is this Calgary? You ask, Calgary is the one page you retain. Calgary Stampede, Cowboy Town, Lute, uh, Lake Louise, ice skating, big bands, the only place in the heavy fall. Now I'll finish oh. I will uh, finish with an analogy for my father. And when I was thinking about it today, and which was read at his funeral, um, Uh, when I was thinking about it, two things I was thinking, I think it was written before he died, which is sort of a whole interesting thing about biography and poetry. Uh, uh, the title called, Nobody Wants to Write an Elegy. And Kevin Young, who will probably come up a lot, or probably has already been up during this conference, uh, <coughs> Institute. Uh, it's a line, he put, uh, his father died, um, let's say, I'm making it five years ago. Uh, He's from Topeka, Kansas. Um, and after his father's death, you know, there's a way we deal with death. And one thing is he put together, he put together a beautiful book of, of elegies. And in his introduction, he says, nobody wants to write an elegy. And that's stuck, you know, stuck in there. Nobody wants to write an elegy. You would do anything to avoid that. You just want one more day with dad, watching Turner classes together, talking about the old days, talking about Canada, talking about the Union Pacific Radio, Ray, Railroad, talking about being broke and on the road with the band, talking about mother gone almost 10 years. He still misses her. I would be so glad if she just walked through that door, son. The next movie brings him back to his early teens when he was an usher in one of those grand movie palaces in Calgary. He begins to get away from me, walking toward the screen, 
in his majestic, almost military uniform. He disappears from the room. He is gone. Nobody wants to ride an elegy. You would do anything to avoid that. Everybody wants just one more day. Thank you. does this annual uh, poetry festival called Wordstock on campus. So I dusted it off um, to, uh, and I actually made some changes to it to, uh, to read it at Wordstock. And um, I'll read my poem, and then I have two poems written by my husband, um, Gary Fox, so I'll read after that. This poem is entitled Cold. They pass us on the street, our faces ice, wondering why we don't smile. We shelter our hearts and blood from the warmth of people for fear that our faces will melt. Under the flesh and bone lie secret touches, scalding hot feelings we've worked hard to make snow. They walk by in scorn. They couldn't handle a blizzard or our fatal icicles that jab us full of holes. <laughs> Uh, by my husband, Gary Fox, who was born and raised in Philadelphia. Um, so you'll see some of that uh, coming off of, the, off of the page. Old cliche in Philadelphia. The good, the bad, and the ugly held a press conference. Vowed to get him in honor of the fallen officer. Three men per car. <coughs> Citywide search, as if Armageddon started. And they're the horsemen. Family comes first. His cousin in cuffs for aiding and abetting, stashing guns. In Miami, ex-top sheriff pledges his allegiance, places his mugshot on TV. Too ugly to hide. <laughs> Found in homeless shelter, confused, distraught, laid off, no job, baby on way, remorseful, guilty. They sent the slain's cuffs down to cuff him. Another press conference. They got the cop killer, while a PGW meter man shot in the back on the job, working overtime for Christmas money. Killer still on the loose, business as usual. And this last poem, since we had um, we listened to a, a poem earlier this week about the Eastern Shore, um, I asked my uh, husband to send this other poem. Um, about a trip that we took. We we're trying to uh, follow the Harriet Tubman uh, Friedman Trail in preparation for a course that I teach because I was going to take my students on it. So we were sort of trying to follow the trail and um, that was sort of the inspiration for this poem. So I thought it'd be nice to try to share another Eastern Shore poem. Uh, it's titled, Joseph Stewart's Canal, Fall 2012. On the Tubman Trail, looking for the canal that slaves dug, bamboozled by lack of markers, bad pamphlet directions, we stop on a bridge over a symmetric creek, straightforward, black water, can't hide the blue heron or white plump clouds reflected. When we look up, peepholes, slanted, sunlight, exposing generic heaven, underbelly, racing along clean blacktop. A turkey vulture observes on a naked branch. We wonder where the hell we are. This uh, first poem is called Varadero. Alone out onto the Caribbean Sea where it meets the Atlantic and where your grandest mother held on to tiny splinters of cypress lying bound in a sisterhood of excrement and fear. I gaze and wait for you to return. I sit here waiting on motherhood, hoping that I will not abandon my daughter so. You are not here, yet always here. And I can't bring myself to go where your smell lingers in every little crevice, where your face greets me in the mirror each morning. In my sleep, I see you. I hear you even now in these waves. Seven years here for you. A sisterhood formed without you. Las mujeres sin madres. But I am the only one at the seaside today. 
waiting on motherhood. Okay, um, this poem is called Shame, and I and I have to. Um, it includes some Jamaican language. Um, in Jamaica, well, you know the word foreign, an adjective, but in Jamaica, it becomes, in Jamaican language, it becomes a noun. So foreign becomes a place. So like the United States is a place called foreign. So if you're going to the United States, you'll say, oh, I'm going to foreign. <clears throat> so it's a noun. Shame. I am a stranger here in my home. I smell foreign. Smell like foreign, look like foreign. Their eyes follow me. I have not been here, and I remember too late how to walk broadly with a slow wind in my hips, hands akimbo or turned out far. The swift short steps and timid stance have given me away, even before my smell, my look, my foreign clothes. Excuse me. Yes, I want to ask you something. Don't shame me. I want to ask you something. I have to eat. I am trapped here. Foreign, so far away, so near. I have nothing. I am here for my dead. Uh, this one is called Carry On Items. A familiar silence and then a familiar hum. Pleasantries. A familiar look from unmoving, unfamiliar faces. All carry on items below the seat. Welcome home. And I carry on all carry on items in the bin above my head. Laughter, familiar memories, and the familiar smell of a sweaty head of gray hair. It's not masala today. Dettol and urine and blood, iron, carry on. Far away from those frail legs and mapped hands, knuckles pushing against new old skin, carry on. We have time for um, This one is called Sawdust. Uh, this one is for my father. <coughs> Sawdust. The lumber stretches, long and hard and popped like your legs, a home for sores, round and brown, a center crust of yellow, a community of imperfections, and I inhale. It is your smell without you, without your sweat and the metallic odor on top of wood, without flecks of sawdust in your silver at night hair, I inhale you. A sanitized, pre-treated, uncut, unbolted, unhinged you, your smell in the morning, six o'clock punch, sawdust shavings under your feet, Coleman in your hand, ice cold bickle in this land for me, triangle trusses on your back for me, a chip off the old block, or rather curled and curled shavings, delicate but unfeminine, you are just like your father. Heavy feet, bones marching, steel toes hammering the ground, and your smell, pine, cypress. We went to buy plywood, but got birch instead, and the storm would have taken our roof and left the windows intact. We would have blown out like these shavings, golden fibers in a whirling cyclone, inhaled and lodged in the lungs. I inhale you, your smell without you. subjects, but I'm going to read poems that connect particularly with the Don't Deny My Voice Institute. So after hearing these poems, you might think I only write about this subject, but I, I chose these for this particular audience. The first poem I'm going to read comes out of an incident I had while teaching at Wabash College in southern Indiana, and I was teaching African American literature there. It's called Hands. When my student, 19 and outside Alabama for the first time, comes to my home in rural Indiana, he brings a bottle of soap. When I ask why, he 
tells me I might think his hands aren't clean enough to handle the cookies we're making for the Black History Month reading. Looking at Luther's hands, big, long-fingered, the color of strong black coffee, the palms gloriously pink, unlike mine, a yellowish-orange mottled with blue. I remember the school superintendent in Ernest Gaines' A Lesson Before Dying inspecting the hands of students in the quarter and the teacher's throttled anger. Taking the bowl in my arms, I beat and beat the stiff dough, then pass the thick ball back to Luther. He flowers the counter, then rolls the dough paper thin, his hands sliding lightly over the smooth surface, that surface carrying so much more weight than its tissue-thin layers should have to bear. <laughs> also comes out of teaching. I taught a correspondence course in nonfiction writing out of the University of Iowa for a number of years, and I had a lot of students in prison. And this poem is dedicated to my student, LaShawn. It's called Acts of Terrorism. Three days after the terrorist attacks in New York and Washington, D.C., a correspondence student mails me an essay loaded with acts of terrorism. Guns, knives, bats, anger big enough to blow up buildings. Spinning on the axis of domestic violence, the writer splatters against a wall, blood stains everywhere. Writing from prison, her short sentences try to fill up the long years, 23, starting at 19. She's not alone in her terror, her children motherless, her sister in and out of prison dies of an overdose. Two brothers behind bars. One gets out, a week later murdered. What would we say if entire families perished on September 11th? As it is, we Americans are outraged. Our way of life threatened, civilization itself at risk, unless we smoke out the terrorists, put an end to this evil outside our borders. Ignoring the terror within, where acts of violence explode lives every day. I like to read civil rights history, and this poem comes out of that reading. It's called Leroy Moton. Not many know his name. We don't remember the ones who lived, the ones who got away, terrified, but alive. All week he had driven Highway 80, ferrying folks to the front lines, a black man in a white woman's car, running that green Oldsmobile between Selma and Montgomery. The marchers make it to the Capitol. Through the blinds, Governor Wallace watches as the crowd swells. State troopers, more marchers, the National Guard, entertainers. Everyone's life somewhere on the color line. After the songs and the speeches, Leroy Moton shuttles back and forth to the airport to get marchers out of town before nightfall. At the end of the day, the white woman who owns the car offers to drive. Leroy Moton takes the passenger seat for a final run to Selma. The marchers pile in, three women, two men, four white, one black. The car drops them off, leaving a black man and a white woman sitting side by side as they retrace the marchers' route, the car with the Michigan plates picking up the red dirt of Alabama. A blue car crosses the yellow line to cut off this rearrangement. Gunfire. The driver dies. Beneath a beam of light, the black man plays dead, then runs for help in the dark. Leroy Moton and Viola Liuzzo, quick in the dead, a black man and a white woman, redrawing the lines for all of us. Amen. And the final poem I'm going to read, uh, I 
I drew on details from Dina Temple Raskin's book, A Death in Texas. It's called Chains. Before they chained him to the truck, they spray painted his face black. The molecules of paint sliding into his lungs. The darkness of that night now inside him. Revving up the truck, they dragged him, laying down a wavy red line as the body of James Bird zigzagged back and forth. A set of dentures popped out. A mile down Huff Creek Road, the body swung around a bend and hit a culvert. A blackened head sheared off. When mortician Dory Coleman and his father, who knew every black man in Jasper, picked up the head, and two miles further the body, they had no idea who was riding with them. And now that we know, what are we to do with this terrible sundering? This body broken for what? This history chained to us. Thank you. How you guys doing? Yeah. Uh, you know by now that I like music. So I'm gonna ask my cousin to open this poem, set the stage for this poem. Cousin? <laughs> but now and found was blind, but now I see. It isn't Negro, but it is spiritual. It do speak to the power of redemption, to power, period. Converting loss to found, creating sight where there was none, but what sound could be so powerfully sweet? Sweet enough to turn a wretched slave ship captain into England's most outspoken abolitionist and songwriter? Was it the splash of bodies dragged kicking and screaming, jettisoned off decks to the outstretched arms of ocean coral? Was it the crack of the whip or the popping sound bloody flesh makes when a sizzling branding iron breaks the skin? The sound of fear and confusion below deck, muffled by the sound of rape up above? The sound of 609 beating hearts sardine into a space for 300. Amazing is to be lost and blind and still the captain, a willing participant in crimes against humanity. But what was that sound, that liberating release, granting pardons for penance undone? What does forgiveness sound like. Not every time you hear Amazing Grace, listen for John Newton's apology, his silent sobs seeking salvation. Listen and hear what healing sounds like. Tis grace has brought us safe thus far, and grace will lead us Thank you, cousin. All right. I only got eight minutes, so don't clap in between the palms. I'm 
gonna read. I'm gonna close with three poems from uh, from Turn Me Loose, the Unghost of the Mega Everest. And for me and a lot of people, there's not a lot of distance between Trayvon Martin and Emmett Till and those cases. Okay. Uh, so listen for when you hear those. Uh, all these poems are in voices of other people uh, involved in this tragedy. The first voice I'm going to read is actually the voice of Byron de Lubecki, the assassin. The second voice will be Merle Evers, and I'll close with the voice of the bullet. And the epigraph uh, of this first poem is taken from a quote Byron de Lubecki said while giving a speech at a Klan rally. He said that killing that nigga gave me no more inner discomfort than our wives endure when they give birth to our children. After birth, uh, Byron de Lubecki. Like them, a man can't conceive an idea, an event, a moment so clearly he can name it even before it breathes. We both can carry a thing around inside for only so long and no matter how small it starts out, it can swell and get so heavy our backs hurt and we can't find comfort enough to sleep at night. All we can think about is the relief that waits at the end. When it was finally time, it was painless. It was the most natural thing I'd ever done. I just closed my eyes and squeezed. Then opened them and there he was, just laying there, covered with blood, but already trying to crawl. I must admit, like any proud parent, I was afraid at first, afraid he'd live, afraid he'd die too soon. Funny how life and death there's a whole lot of pushing and pulling, holding and seeking breath. A whole world turned upside down until some body screams. Merely others, an imagined commentary to the two wives, the first and second wife of Bauer de la Becker, Thelma and Willie de la Becker. Sorority meeting. My faith urges me to love you. My stomach begs me to not. All I know is that day made us sisters somehow. After long nervous nights and trials on end, we are bound together in this unholy sorority of misery. I think about you every time I run my hands across the echoes in the hollows of my sheets. They seem loud as just before I wake. I open my eyes every morning, half expecting Megger to be there. Then I think about you, and your eyes always snatch me back. Your eyes won't let me forget. We are sorority sisters now, with a gut-wrenching country ballad for sweetheart song and tired funeral and courtroom clothes for colors and secrets we will take to our graves. I was forced to sleep night after night after night with a ghost. You chose to sleep with a killer. We all pledged our love, crossed our hearts, and swallowed oaths before being initiated with a bullet. And this is the voice of the bullet. One third of 180 grams of lead and the details are taken right from the court transcripts. Both of them were history, even before one pulled the trigger. Before I rocketed through the smoking barrel hidden in the honeysuckle. Before I tore through a man's back, shattered his family, a window, and tore through an inner wall. Before I bounced off a refrigerator and a coffee pot before I landed at my destined point in history next to a watermelon. What was cruel was the irony, not the melon, not the man falling in slow motion, 
but the man squinting through the crosshairs, reducing the justice system to a small circle, praying that he not miss, then sending me to deliver a message as if the woman screaming in the dark or the children crying at her feet could ever believe a bullet was small enough to hate. And I want to have time one more. I don't want to leave in that dark place. Uh, I don't know that this is lighter, but in a way it is because <laughs> I want to believe it is. This is from uh, the sequel to Buffalo Dance that's about the Lewis and Clark expedition, but tells the story from uh, York, the African American manservant, and the sequel from the women who were part of this expedition. Uh, and I'm going to read a poem that's called Say My Name because of, the, of what we're here for. Don't deny my voice. And if you can imagine that this is the wife of York who's been gone for three years, right? And now he's back. Say my name, York's slave wife, enslaved wife. Folks around here want to call me auntie. York's old wife or master so-and-so's nigga wench. Like, I ain't got a name of my own. Them don't know how hard it be to put aside a little piece of myself that nobody can never touch but me. A piece big enough to wrestle the long, hard days and keep itself warm at night without a man around. Them don't know what it like to stand in the dark night after night wrapped in that buffalo robe he sent. Look up at the stars and wonder which ones is looking down on him and believe if anything had bad happened to him out there that I would feel it too. When he come home, I don't need him to say he loved me. I don't need him to bring me gifts. I just want him to hold me close, make like he glad to see me, bend down to my ear and whisper my name. Thank you. I love you, kids, but I can't read after him. Um, well, uh, most of us know uh, me as a critic, uh, but my ideas come to me as poems. Um, my mentor, Jerry Ward, knows me. I introduced, we got introduced uh, when I was a young poet, and I was active for 10 years in uh, Congo Square Writers Union in New York, in uh, New Orleans, which was uh, founded by Tom Dent, uh, who was my mentor, and that also included Kalam Salam. So um, I ended up having to translate my ideas um, into critical essays. Um, this is probably good, I, good that nobody knows me as a poet now, but um, when I'm asked to introduce people, that side of my sensibility comes out. So when I was at the University of Alabama, which I uh, worked for 11 years, um, I became a close friend with uh, a blues musician named Willie King. He took me under his wing and he would teach me a few things. He would, uh, say I'm gonna baptize him. <laughs> so he would play uh, all over the world, um, and uh, but he had a real affinity to people that he would describe as uh, living in the woods in Alabama, which really was uh, out there. Uh, it was like going back in time. Uh, barbed wire fences, uh, no paved roads. Um, you really would have to have someone who knew the area to take you. And he would perform on Sunday nights. Uh, he was really a secular priest. Uh, he had maybe a second grade in education, maybe. Played, learned to play on a, a, a one string homemade sort of guitar, uh, but he was a brilliant man. 
um, this is probably not cool to say it now, but he was uh, part of an organization for a while uh, before I met him that had an affiliation with the Communist Party. So he's a very sharp political thinker. For example, when George Bush talked about terrorism and so forth after 9-11, he wrote a song called Terrorized and he talked about how he had been terrorized. So, and uh, to see him perform uh, was infectious. Um, this was the backwoods. He played at a place called Betty's Place. These were people that the whole world had stereotyped, including black people. Uh, but I saw nothing but beauty there and integrity. The only taboo was disrespect. And you could really observe the centrality of the body in black music making and in black vernacular culture generally. Everybody danced from 25, that you, you would see the 18 and 20 year olds there, but uh, from mid 20s on up, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, mid 70s and late 70s, everybody danced, everybody had their own dance and they could all dance. Uh, they were all great dancers, right? So I saw things uh, that people would do with their bodies you would never see in a club. And I was someone who hung out in the clubs in New Orleans uh, for so long that I saw the dancers come back. So uh, I know a little bit about what was, you know, okay. It's <laughs> just a, just a confession, right? So um, we gave him the key to the city in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. Um, and I was asked to uh, introduce him. Um, I'm, I, this was the part that survived. Uh, so I, I'm calling this uh, Blues Memoir, Willie King in Chicago, 1967, in remembrance of blues guitarist and singer Willie King, 1943 to 2009. Boom, 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 boom. Knee bones beat. Black bodies blue. Ebony eyes facing over. Saxophones and Jimmy Max. Strand black sticks and hats. Painted nails and tail feather suits. Lipstick and juicy fruit. Thick chocolate cherry spread over a duck. Then pluck him on the table with his eggs propped up. Way dang doodle. Snake hip quiver. Boogie down and rump roll shiver. Snatch it back and hold it tight. Prance and dance till broad daylight. Red water muddy. Hawk steady back, but listen at that timber wolf howl. He filed his teeth on guitar strings, going down slow, going down slow. Way down the bottom on the killing roof floor. <laughs> Am I excited to be here? I am interested to be here. White people in evening dresses and tuxedos, just like in the movies. <laughs> this city makes young people look so young. Apparition of faces, petals and brown leaves. The old folks fit right into the scape. If you're buff, you get a skin tight. Do they, do they know they look like they know they look commodified? <laughs> Sign on computer, be aggressive. Sign at encampment, debt is slavery. Kid at Starbucks, would you like that in a bag? Me, but 
It's already in a bag. Kid. No, I meant, did you want it in a bigger bag? I'm going to read one more. This is called the Tex Avery Environmentalist. Um, I don't know if anybody knows Tex Avery. He was a cartoonist, uh, animator in the 1960s. And he did all these cartoons with these animals doing unspeakable cartoon violence to each other. Um, and I have no idea what he was like, but I just sort of imagined him as his character. So it's called Tex Avery Environmentalist. Tex Avery, American environmentalist, lived in the Alaskan wilderness at the legend of Rockabye Point in 1955. This is Alaska, the final frontier, Tex said. Sure, we're rooting for the wolves and all, but... And here, Tex's gaze would hover at the horizon where sun dogs whited out the landscape in multiple mirages as he powered his 98 Regis Brome leather AC power everything riding back and hose the works across the fragile tundra. I'm going to feel really bad about this Sunday. His farm of tomorrow had a pig, a horse, and an anvil. He had to invent the Tasmanian devil who can no longer waddle placidly through life. Of course you know this means war, is the typical response. He did not prove to be a helpful insect, but rather infested hot rod and biker illustrations, monster and exploitation movies, science fiction pulps, sleazy magazines, lurid comic books, sailor tattoos, and Polynesian pop. The tiger salamander proved a babbling idiot cartoon species, a compassionate trickster. But Tex always warned us that we, the consumers, might be victimized by the very machines that promise an easier, more extravagant life. Sadly, the congregation just told him to fuck off, what with his wiser than thou amb ambivalence toward the goofy gophers and all. Yes, sir, Tex would say around the campfire in his gravelly western twang. The only thing I regret in life is maintaining that darn nature culture binary. <laughs> Speaking of live action footage of talking animals, wacky, wet dream, rapid sheer, cute little box, social cupcake babies with the phrases, we doggies, and let us all lip synchronize in advocacy for animated animals, my brothers, before the comet comes to pick us up. This was Texas' motto as transferred to genetically engineered damsel plants demeanor in the peculiar soil of Disney skepticism. A priceless jewel thief presents inanimate objects to the secret life of Porky's poultry. He tried to save the endangered turkey in the straw, Pavo yup yup yupus, but the ambiguous cherries hung too heavy to poop. Thank you. When they had mentioned reading poetry, uh, thought about this piece that um, I titled The Body Knows Deeply What I Do Not Know. And literally a month ago today, June 27th, I had um, taken some time out to spend with a group of women who are in a state of recovery from their addictions at the Palmer Rehab for Women and Children. It's the only center in the state of Oklahoma that allows women to bring their children in with them after they've gone through the withdrawal period and are at a place of stability. And uh, ironically enough, after I spent time sharing with them and then eating lunch, one of the women shouted out and said, will you remember us? And uh, that just stayed with me. So uh, I have one note. There's a, a word that I use, love dub, love dub. That is actually the sound of the heart and the stethoscope from the doctor's ears, just FYI. And it's dedicated to she who overcomes. So I was sharing this with Carla, and I said, you should probably do a dance to this if you could. She's like, I don't know. Um, so we pulled some things together. So this is for the women and anyone whose experience resonates with them. The What I do not know, in 111 still sleep, the heart stutters to a dull lub-dub, lub-dub, echoing.
echoing the thumb's thump on the needle's side till bubble free salvation empties the soul pouring forth shame. With no witnesses to bear the past dumbbell thud to the ground, littered with smitherings of dreams falling from the tree of life disease by the invisible funk of failed ripened anticipation, swaying like the body betrayed, by eyes roaming east to west, by tongue swollen fast talking, forgetting the wet morsels of life, traded for amnesia, revived by the stomach's pains, defying the heart's red light to the right. Where olds are made with hand raised before God, Speak the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. The body knows deeply what I do not know. Wounds, cockade, like spreaded lips, pushing sorrows, wailing within, without as if hollowness above and below utter grandmother's frail struggles on land and water, even before antique gritting of teeth and clenched fists, punching to the soul the grief of agents. The body knows deeply of membrane, tissue, teeth, and shit. Out, 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 out. Through the throat of the canal, birthing a genesis. To stand on tiptoes, reaching for hope's fingertips. When the heels caress the soil of desire, laughter yawns from tears, breaking the heart into a smile to match the twitching toes, the muscles ready to be free from the soul's atrophy, to leap, to shout with the body, to shout with the body, to shout with the body, ecstasy. I'm going to try to get through this very quickly, but I thought I would do this one because we spent a lot of time talking about Malcolm. And this is called Mind Over Malcolm, which I wrote for a documentary that was in Rochester because Malcolm's last public address was actually in Rochester. It's divided into, it actually is an adaptation of Alex Haley's uh, autobiography of Malcolm X. So it goes all the way through his life. <laughs> Omaha, Nebraska, Lansing, Michigan. Little is understood, much known, of those first instinctive urges from which expectantly surges out into a world angrily heated white, cloaked in innocent night, a tree of slain little sinners dangle and drop limb by limb. A cold car father touches steel streetcar tracks. His garbyite eyes star starkly stare back and forth across a bloody red legacy, passed on to his seventh child, a red-haired son. The yellow, strong black mother of the red-haired son sees male scream death as her four little babes cry out for feeding while nestled in protective soft arms, amputated of a little strong support. The bow maker bends and breaks under sudden, sudden pressure, and the four little babes too soon thrown from their country comfortable nest fly fiend for feedings of their own. The wayward red-haired son of the cold-carved father and the cage-crazed mother cries out 
from the all white house. Now you see me, now you don't. Now you need me, but I won't. Look and let little dreams come true. So I'm leaving, cause I don't settle for nothing. No, I won't, because I'm Malcolm, a militant martyred movement of a man, minding matters of grave importance. Boston, Massachusetts. Hair, pink and red, suit, country green, height, string and bean, a too strong young black boy. Just take that little shine, you hear? Pop that dirty firecracker fast. Let it hop them legs till they's off the ground. And stop your red head from turning around. A conk, a zoot suit, a country boy with class. <laughs> Harlem, New York. Cool daddy, new cat hit Harlem town. How to how to how to how to ho, my man, get on down. A long, lanky, lean loving machine. Detroit Red here, go on and make this scene. I got what you want. I know what you need. No shucking and driving, just jackrabbit speed. Reapers, women, dice, booze, and bebop. Coke, clothes, and cash. I'm a one-stop shop because I'm Malcolm, a militant martyred movement of a man, minding matters of grave importance behind bars. Staring at the stars through iron bars for seven of ten walled in years. Little by little become Satan, for God was not there nor here nor anywhere until a nation rose up out of the ashes of dead sin, seas, and shores. Until books laboriously eaten inside, proud painfully exploded on other stenciled, pinned up numbers who debate faction, fit, and fate. And writing was reason daily on Allah's henchman Elijah, who helped little habits die hard. Wall, gates, and iron gates part as the unshackled spirit soars from its seven-year nesting place to lease little's life back in a city driven by assembly line lives and pristine parks that make up Cadillac dreams. So little moves grease lightning to buy back black souls from a nation under Allah's control. And with the messenger's blessing, little becomes Muslim X and temple too bulges and bursts from the weight of his burdened soul seeking Allah's life. And as Minister Markham meets his goal, his tongue lashes eager and acid, spearing forth the nation truth. White is evil and evil is white. Devils are evil and evil devils are white. But I'm still Malcolm, a militant modern movement of a man minding matters of grave importance. Marriage. Sister soft strength strolled in, staggering brother Malcolm's resolve, and they plunge heart first, head first into surprise I do's, consummated repeatedly and rapidly with exquisite baby princesses, growing pretty and fatherless as ex crisscross the globe, but the nurse babies welcome Malcolm home in blitz bits of stolen time a nation break. Malcolm speaks for Muhammad, but the nation turns green and mute. Brother breaks brittlely into battle while tarnished lusters continue to corrode across time. An angel plummets from heaven into Harlem, and his dazed antenna raised to mounting unrest. The nation excludes him. Sleep eludes him. Love exudes from him. Brotherhood now includes him. El Haj Malik El Shabazz. Mecca was the mountain top that Malcolm moved up. Now El Haj Malik Shabazz is a proud prophet who walks the eternal pilgrimage, linking all of us who work within each of us to free all of us red, black, white, yellow, brown. The nation door is bolted. The home fire has burned. The ballroom remains blasted. His face smiles to the east and west. The tracks of his father and the noose of his uncle. The cries 
of his mother, all Belcom, Pilgrim, all Beckon, Pilgrim, Malcolm, home, welcome home, welcome home, welcome home, little Detroit Red Malcolm X, uh, Minister Carl L. Ha Shalik Shabazz, because you are there, Malcolm. A militant moderate movement of a man mocked in matters of grave importance. So this one is, I, I went through my head trying to figure out what I was going to do when um, Dr. Ward told me last week he was pulling his elder card. <laughs> um, this is, is, is sort of what I do with poetry. So the poem is The Welder by Sharon Moraga. The choreography is by Killian Manning of University of North Carolina at Greensboro and myself. The welder. I am a welder, not an alchemist. I am interested in the blend of common elements to make a common thing. No magic here. Only the heat of my desire to fuse what I already know exists is possible. We all plead with each other. We all come from the same rock. We all come from the same rock. Ignoring the fact that we each bend at different temperatures, that we are each malleable up to a point. Yes, fusion is possible, but only if things get hot enough. All else is temporary adhesion, patching up. It is the intimacy of steel melting into steel, the fire of our passions to take hold of ourselves that builds structures of our lives, builds buildings. And I'm not talking about skyscrapers, merely structures that are able to support us without fear of trembling. For too long a time now, the heat of my heavy hands have been smoldering in the pockets of other people's business. They need oxygen to start a fire. I am now coming up for air. I am picking up the torch. I am the welder. I understand the capacity of heat to change the shape of things. I am suited to work within a realm of sparks out of control. I am the welder. And I am taking the power into my own hands. Common elements into common things. No magic here. What already exists. Steel melting into steel. We all come from the same rock. We all come from the same rock. Bending at different temperatures. Malleable. heat of my heavy hands, smoldering in the pockets of other people's business. I am now coming up for air. I am picking up the torch. Round those sparks, out of control, I am taking the power into my own hands. from my dissertation. Just kidding. <laughs> shooting in Chicago, on the south side of Chicago. He survived the shooting, but was shot in the head, so he was pretty seriously dislocated. Um, so on the, you know, when I could on the weekends, I'm flying from Virginia up to uh, Chicago to be 
with him and stay with him for several years through this incident until it really, until it wasn't um, something that I could continue in my life. And then the second thing that was happening when I applied back to Virginia, my job was working with children in Head Start program and the things that they were doing. So I was seeing things with the body, I was seeing things with survival, and so I'm going to read a couple poems. Some of them are, my boyfriend's name then was Kevin, um, some of them are Kevin poems, some of them are children's poems about being a Head program that I call Teaching Journal. So here we go. Bed. I watch him now at bedtime, move damp cloths across his face, his arms, the left breastbone skin graft from the first time he was shot by accident at age six by his father. I swab his nostrils and his ears. I hold a plastic dish beneath his lower lip. He thrusts a toothbrush with the arm that moves. And then I change his diaper rolling him to balance on one hip and then the other, now mostly bones, but still too hard to lift. I tuck his penis gently towards the folds below so we don't wake wet in the night. He reaches for me still as his beloved. He asks me to do what we did before. Yeah. Teaching journal. To play dying with Marianella two months after. First, you need all the blankets, the ones from the baby crib and the ones from the blue pots. I won't need my shoes on. You can't be looking when I fall, but when you see me, cover me up like this. Tuck my feet and my arms together, tighter than at nap time, and pull the blanket up so my face is gone. Then turn away, look out the window, and talk about me, how fun I am to play with. You have to cry loud so I can hear you under there, and you can't be looking. But when I hear you cry enough, I'll wake up and we'll dance. When it's your turn, I'll make sure there are blankets to cover you, and my voice will be loud. <laughs> Night and day. When I think of you, I think of Emmett Till. Both young men come down from Chicago to Mississippi, but from there the similarities warp and splinter like the skin and bones of your stalls after the work of bullets. Emmett, I'm sure, did not want that white lady store owner, only bubblegum. A stutterer, he whistled first to free the words. But you came to Jackson to love a white woman in the open, to hold my hand in the daylight. You were alone when two men robbed you at gunpoint on Pascagoula Street and left you unharmed. They took your dead brother's necklace. You boarded a Greyhound to return up south to be shot two weeks later on your own south side Chicago lawn. The why makes the difference, but in the end means nothing. Emmett's murderers burning white hot with righteousness in that Mississippi midnight. Their hatred so focused they forged from it a cotton gin fan, bound it to his neck with barbed wire, and sunk his corpse in the Tallahatchie. But you, black gunmen firing out a car window, hatred, yes, but aimless and diffuse, bullets scattered roughshod across a Sunday morning. So this is teaching journal, scissors. Fraternal twins, Addison's forehead slider of angle, his blonde shag frays down over his eyes. Sam's hair grows up and out like Cain's crops sprouting from soil. Sam stabs space for seven stitches through the skin of his twin's skull. Who knows why? Sam can't say. Four years old, he doesn't know that words can slow the wrath of hands, that we learn to say first, I'm angry. After Sam away wielding wood blocks, Addison can still spend choice time with scissors. Addison cuts, then he builds for stretches of hours. Pipe cleaners, pom-poms, lengths of felt, jars of glitter. Each afternoon before their mother comes, 
we help Addison put on what he's made, the animal offering in place of his flesh, that morning's bright mask, his new shining face. And I have one last one that's a teaching journal, and it's a little more on the regenerative side of life. Here we go. And this, this happens. This is just my recording, the poetry of young children. Here we go. <laughs> teaching journal matrimony, or how I gave birth to baby Jesus. <laughs> Here we go. How I gave birth to baby Jesus. Caesarean section. Nevaeh performed it, heaven spelled backwards. Lenage assisted. Yellow fork and blue knife from the plastic kitchen rubbed over my belly. The girl's face is frowning above me. Nevaeh cupped both her hands, fingers pressed tight. Microscopic Jesus. Don't drop him, she said. I curled both my hands as small as I could, and she poured him in. His name is Tanisha. <laughs> Nevaeh decided. Then Lenage and I got married. I kneeled, she stood. I cradled baby Jesus. She wrapped a blanket over her hair like the virgin. Nevaeh presided, enchanted a song in a secret language, and at the precise moment, she cued my vows in an urgent whisper, sing twinkle. <laughs> I sang with my eyes closed. My bride held the baby. My turn, Nevaeh said. <laughs> So um, I'm going to start with the, with the mild disclaimer that I am more than just a little bit nervous standing here, um, especially because you guys are so good. Can we give them all a round of applause? Yeah. Um, I originally signed up planning to read you know, a little Dunbar, do a little other people's work, and then uh, Sarah Rudwalker, causing trouble as always, convinced me to um, actually read a couple of my own. Yes. So, um, and so I, I don't write or read very often, um, but in thinking about uh, what to bring in this week, I was thinking a lot about our conversations around the kind of ideas around masculinity and um, taking on more expanded views of masculinity, which require a certain amount of vulnerability. So I'm here um, in that spirit today. Um, so the first piece, is called Running Man. <laughs> what are you running from? From the beatings your body has endured? Have lesser men worked overtime to leave you broken and bruised? Or do you run from the manglers of your mind, those who have posed tests that you fear you fail? Are you fleeing the fortress that was your solitary confinement? Did you ever realize that you were never really running alone? That your particular race wasn't only being run in your home? Did you believe you were the only one chasing the tire marks of fathers who left too soon? Or hunting dear mothers who haven't held you tightly since you left their womb? Were you running from the misery of having no company or trapped in the reality that yours is a collective history? Attempting to outrun your past will only leave you with a wounded spirit and weary souls. Footprints that cannot be retraced will never remind you of the victory of first steps you never thought you could take, the strength you summoned in order to stand tall when others wanted you on your knees, or the joyous moments that compelled you to dance. Stand in the remembrance of the genesis of your greatness. Know that your creation was a commandment for light, that your breath came not from man but was divine inspiration, that your brilliance was meant to brighten the path to revelation. Know that your future was not wishful thinking but a prophecy only waiting to be fulfilled. Stand still. Let your heart rate lay at rest for a moment. Let the rhythms of its beat set the pace for the rest of us to move to. Stand still. Let us run to you. Um, so the, the, um, the second one is one that I have not done in a very long time, primarily because it was kind of a love poem, and the object of affection is no longer in any way, shape, or form. Um, uh, a part of, a part of uh, my life. And so, it's one that I kind of put on the back burner, but I, um, I brought it in really because, though, uh, though that did not last, the 
um, poem itself was really kind of the first time I'd ever really let myself be vulnerable enough to write something like this and to perform it publicly, and so I, I wanted to bring it in today. Um, it's called Opening Verse, an RSVP. You're just too good to be true. Can't take my eyes off of you. You'd be like heaven to touch. I want to hold you so much. Oh, yes, love has arrived. And I thank God I'm alive. You're just too good to be true. Can't take my eyes off of you. I really don't like you very much. <laughs> See, I've always disliked the feeling of fear, and you terrify me. More than anything, I'm afraid that you're just too damn good to be true. I suppose the cure to my apprehension is total comprehension, and that's why I study you. But it's frustrating. It is maddening that I really cannot keep my eyes off of you. To say nothing of my thoughts, whether I'm wide awake or in my dreams, in the fabric of my consciousness, you are the stitching in the seams. More to the point, in my efforts to break the constantly commanded contact with your eyes, I find myself utterly motionless, paralyzed. Trouble is, as easily as I become lost in the inestimable depths of that dark brown hair, they also reveal precisely where I want to be, wherever you are, right there. Don't worry, they. No need for suspicions about my intentions. Though my gaze may be penetrating, break and enter is a crime I will not be perpetrating. The windows to your soul will remain latched and intact, and I will wait, peering into the peerless until you invite me in. Nor will I coax my way in through some weakness in your resolve. I refuse entry by means of manipulation, and I reject cunning as a catalyst to consummation, so I will wait at the gate. Steadfast until you invite me in. I will wait, standing face to face, so close our every blink will be in synchronized time, so close with every think we'll ask, was that your idea or mine? So close our eyelashes will intertwine until you invite me in. I will wait, pressed nose to nose because God knows your scent must be heaven sent. So I feel no guilt having lost all my sense in the intoxicating aroma of you until you invite me in. I will wait, lips lingering near lips, inhaling on your exhale, finding inspiration in your respiration, filling my lungs to capacity and oxygenating my blood cells with the faintest whisper of you. Until you invite me in, I will wait, connected chest to chest, while the very best of you, your heart, beats the very worst of who I am out of me, driving me to want to be a better man with the force of every until you invite me in. And when you do, finally, let me inside. All I ask is that you be my guide. Lead me through every crevice and every corner, revealing turn by turn the complexity of who you are. I beg of you. I want to know you in your totality. Don't want to track your footsteps. I need you to do a walking tour with me. I crave familiarity with the collection of treasures you call memory. I want to see every single image your mind's eye has captured in its gallery. I want to know the moments behind the moments behind the moments in the photographic timeline of how you came to be. I want to sing your favorite musical selections as the soundtrack to your recollections. I want to rise to the pulse of your rhythms and fall into the groove of your beats, learn to harmonize bass with the melody, leave the formula etched into sheets. I want to thumb through the pages of words that have brought you knowledge, comfort, and peace. I want to meander through the bookshelves of your mind. I want to know your wants. I need to know your needs. Though some may be blinded by the beauty of a flower, I see God within the seeds. I plan to tend to you with tenderness and cultivate with care, nurture your spirit with every sweet caress, make your burdens mine to bear the weariness 
in your souls. Can I outrun the soothing chase of my fingertips and any tears that dare to shed will stop dead in their tracks at the kiss of my lips. When the world gives you its worst, I'll be your rest, your refuge, your relaxation. All I ask you to do first is to extend the invitation. In the meantime, please. Pardon the way that I stare. There's nothing else to compare. The sight of you leaves me weak. There are no words left to speak. But if you feel like I feel, please let me know that it's real. You're just too good to be true. Can't take my eyes off you. Oh, yeah. Nothing to say on this birthday of my dead brother. 
We walk gingerly on the battered boardwalk around branches and stumps of oak, maple, ash, hickory, taken by the seed and spit back where sand bend. Both of my granddaughters have an affinity for Latin men. Mother, how am I supposed to respond to that? I am 90. You don't respond, you just listen. <laughs> you know, son, when the tour guide said shipping, he meant slaves. Frozen cattails jut out the edges of the only moon left. You should have said something, son. This is your home now. Raised your hand and told him, look closely at that ship in the bottle on the bookcase, young man. Look. Despite all the barrels on the deck, rum was never the point. And finally, this is a sonnet for the wife, speaking of three weeks. Uh, it's called Amethyst June. Amethyst is a traditional gift for a particular anniversary. Uh, Amethyst June from Carol. No couple of 56 should dance so hard at noon to Rick James on the kitchen floor. <laughs> that synthesizer, that bass, barely a shard of dignity left, like a two-finger pour in a crystal highball glass of cheap mess down. No ice because a worm gets killed by the cold. And this moment, this memory still wrestles with all the salt marks, sour, sorrow we both hold. Too close too close at times to really revel in our little fingers, blue skin, acid gut, that makes this long dance a blade to bevel into our life, all the sweat, desire, and luck that after three decades and three years lets us grasp each other around the sea. Mm -hmm. In 1960, <laughs> Gordon Howley was 19 years old when he was arrested for the murder of Tiny Denton in Dawson, Georgia. Gordon and Tiny were friends. Tiny was a grocery man store manager, but Gordon was participating in civil rights demonstrations in Terrell, Botero County. And so when they arrested him for participating in these civil rights demonstrations, they attached Gordon and Tiny's murder to Gordon. He had nothing to do with it. He spent almost 15 years in jail before he was released. This first poem is called Blackness 101, in, this, in, in response to what I learned and discovered about the earth. Little black boy sits in the dark waiting for recognition or for, in the nick of time, divine intervention to crash down upon his oppressed skin and wash him whiter than snow so he, like his blue-eyed brothers and sisters, can be saved. But the sin of his flesh holds fast and refused release and covers him in darkness. And he wonders about the growing pain in his chest from the pinch of the white cop's black stick when he was struck for not moving fast enough while marching for his rights. 1963, 35 African-American girls ranging in age 10, to 16 were arrested in America's war for participating in civil rights demonstration. They were taken to a, an abandoned civil war stockade in Leesburg, where they were held for 45 days with no beds, no, no covers, very little food, half cooking, cooked burgers and stuff like that. Um, we suspect that they were sexually victimized because the women don't talk about it. One of the more outspoken girls is Lulu Westbrooks. She was 15, 16, and one of the more sort of leaders in that group. This next poem is in the voice of Lulu as she's trying to comfort those girls while they're enduring the, these 45 days. Oh, now, remember, their parents had no idea what they were taking for 45 days. So what can I tell you? America has built a reputation on telling half-truths and of hundreds of years of discovering lands already inhabited. I would love to tell you that we would be here long enough to see things change, but all I can give you is a word, a promise of truth, respect, honor, and hope. So you have to listen. Come in real close to what I have to say. Take in a deep breath. Inhale the possibilities and know that you have the power in your lungs to shout clear from all being to the world when you speak positivity. 
So listen. Listen to the sound of greatness, the aura of change, the vibration of movement, the chorus of heavenly voices, majestic, and knowing that it is not about this world. I pray more than any of us that we live to see at least one more day surviving on leftovers, but still firm in our knowing that we are more than our circumstances and capable of surpassing our fears. Our possibilities are endless, our dreams eternal. We are, you and me, the things most hopeful, the evidence of our family's greatest triumphs. So no, beloved, we don't end here. We press on to ensure that those most dear to us will hear from us again. And on that day, when we see them, we will remind them that this moment has taken nothing from us, for it has no power except what we give. We must have faith, and mustard seed size will do to endure the suffering. So yes, there will be hardship. Yes, there will be oppression. And yes, there will be abuse and neglect. But these things are not you. As tragic as they are, they are not your burden. Hardship is not the soul of you beautiful little girls ride, riding your bikes along dusty South Georgia roads. So, recall the scent of perseverance, and remember, the entire world is watching. At this moment, they are looking at you. What will they see, little ones? What will you show them? They are watching, watching, watching you. What will they see? All right, the first poem is uh, called Solitary. It's a short poem. I have tried to be beautiful. I have sung when singing was brother to pain. I have run with my arms stretched out and it slowed me down. I have called you ever and lasting. I have called you done and begin. I held you in a lullaby when there was no sunrise, when my beliefs became dry and brittle like bread in the sun. I have shed many songs and then the birds came and ate them. But this is the only one I remember. And this is a poem called Valentine's Day. There's no such thing as a white girl. Race, that brick made by men, built no temples. We know the world was never white. We know it's a construct, an idea, a sticky substance on rat traps like glue. Once my mother put them out and the hairs were stuck to it. A rat is an, is an animal we are not supposed to feel sorry for, but I did, watching it squirm as I slipped it into a bag from the grocery store while my mother shrieked. She who had done the deed. There's no such thing as a black boy. There's politics in Black History Month. A man in uniform whose back is straight like the finger of my son pointing to the sky. Look, no, look. That was then. This is now. What are roses? What was her name? I liked her and took $2 to school. Licked 25 envelopes shut. Be mine forever. The heart's candy, dusty chalk. My daddy brought my mama a large red, red encased plastic heart, the size of it. Each candy was a mystery. What was in the center? There's no such thing as love. People believe what they want. I know better now. Race is an idea, but a man possessed with it converts it to instinct. Them lions look trained, but they're still animals. It's not about love. And did she love me? or love me not. It was Daisy Duke and Farrah Fawcett on TV. Blonde hair, blue eyes, and little black boys finally immigrating into America by way of integration, by way of the bus ride to the other side of town. There's Lady Liberty above us, 
staring into the ocean while we stand up next to tiny desk and star-spangled banner tired, poor, and weak across the sea where slave ships turn to chalkboard mist. We hold hands. She says, be mine, be mine. And our eyes roll back in our heads. Did she love me or love me not? In this last poem, I write a lot about my parents. Uh, this is a poem about, about my mother. It's called Law. Growing up, there were always two laws. My mother, the greater, the greatest, who made enemies if necessary out of the trash man or the paper board. <laughs> she was a queen without her court and details, command so precise you could not follow if you were not one of her students. If you did not know her nobility, you might think she was crazy in her house dress, standing in the driveway, shutting down football games, or calling the police, or the government, the inspector, all of them. A great law made in heaven, not by God himself, but one of his angels, handed down to earth through a rope in the sky, shipped to Nashville by airmail, and then given as a gift on her birthday to my mother, the Oishas themselves, disguised as vagabonds, door-to-door -door merchants, like Elijah Muhammad and Daddy Grace, before they became men with wings and symbols. And there was the second law, which came from heaven too, a white heaven, like all heavens, I suppose, <laughs> with angels, wings white, large and frightening, and white sheets like laundry day blowing in the wind. <laughs> Even the tiles in the place white. And of course, the people, southern and white, with talk and gentility and a surface kindness and hospitality, which would make you think there never was a South or slave or hatred. And the great talks of God, who fed men with a few fish, who made man and woman who blessed America with Christianity and Ronald Reagan and gave birth <laughs> to tiny heavens all across America where the gospel was followed like strange black men in white neighborhoods. This was 1975, and people were angry and running or slowing down from running or trying to figure out why people were running, and the world was glass then as the world is glass now. But then people walked with that glass like it was their mother's crystal, like she had told them, you better be careful and you better not break it. Like I said, there were two laws. The greater my mother and the lesser made of missionar missionaries and Bibles and hellfire. <laughs> and with these two laws, there were two tongues, one the lesser and one the greater, and two musics and two beauties and two clothes and two friends, two of everything you can imagine, simple and big as an ark, where we walked towards the ship's belly to war in the darkness, to find ourselves, to be saved. Uh, I have a
spend the night on a couch, 155 miles from your troubles, sleeping off the dullness of cheap wine until siren red shrills awake me. I climb into the compact space I named Mercy and sip around the steam coming from the styrofoam cup and rhythm to the roaring hum of my tires on the highway until all travelers' wheels stop as a crushed soul is released from the jaws of life. It is some time before I realize the trees are scans of green and I am near the exit to your house and ponder if I can take your loose gums smacking the names of others with insults and complaints about your arthritis. So it is with old age and silence. I am off the exit as if an angel has taken control of the will. I sit on your shady couch, hearing the grunt of your haunches weighted with ache. We talk about the time you use watered down ketchup to outfox Grandpa Joe's palace touch. I'm unclean, you said. And he lit a match and smoked his hand rolled cigarette. I remember this and the smell of Prince Albert tobacco flakes mingled with rose leaves when I get the call. You have crossed over in pink satin pajama keys with one roller curled to the side to style the hair you have left, soft as tulip petals. I remember this when I run to the place where you found a lull from heavy tobacco hands crushing your tender flesh one time, two times, three times, Four times, five times, six times, seven times, eight times, nine times, ten times. And in between, I remember this when it comes time to find the story of the last. When I chase the sun's trail glittering through the pines and I find it over the Tensaw River. I find it. I find you. There I imagine the red print dress sticking to your back and your thighs pleading for air and jarring rhythm to the fields of cotton scanning before your eyes as you cross from Evergreen to Mobile. I see you dabbing the body's tears from your throat as you pulled in cracked lips to meet the spittle on your tongue, longing for the extra gulp of water you were surprised to find at the station's colored only fountain. I feel the hammering blood pulsing through your veins into the heart when the Mobile 13 miles <clears throat> sign appeared on the side of the road, hailing a rush of barely developed daydream shots. Plenty of money to allow the children quit picking cotton early September when school starts. Me for a change, quit that nagging heifer. Buy that three quarters inch lace slip from Montgomery Ward. Kerosene, bologna, peppermint sticks for the children. Sleep. Space free of a spreading palm that shatters the cheek. Mobile, just 13 miles up the road. I feel the tension in your neck, weighed down by the head, shaking in disbelief. I feel the fire in the crawl space of your soul when the bus quit on you and your dreams just six miles away from Mobile and Creola, red dirt capital for maybes. You couldn't walk the rest of the distance, but you stay in a hotel beside a snatch of the ocean holding bloated fish that ran white folks further down the coast. Even there, you counted the bubble paint spots on the ceiling, trying to figure out what the children had eaten to give them cod liver, and if your mother remembered to give them cod liver oil before bed. You knew every inch of the sunset peeking through the wool curtains. And when it went down, you closed your eyes. Your arms folded like a pillow beneath your head while sleep Walked the last six miles. Oh,
Oh! 
story about Amiri Baraka. It's a poem um, dedicated to him on his 75th birthday. Uh, when I first got here, um, there was a program um, to bring in speakers. And um, one speaker uh, would be from um, African studies, and then the other speaker uh, a couple years later would be from African American studies. And so when uh, the speaker from African American studies um, was scheduled, uh, there was uh, a comment made that they couldn't find an African American speaker. I said, fine. And I want to make this clear. A white person didn't say it. Make this clear. Right. So, you know, you know, my wheels started spinning. I said, well, you know, have to be a PhD. They said, no. Ah. What about Mary Barack? And another story, I don't have time for that, but we got to hear Barack. And um, I had read, um, actually in the past, I was doing some research for something else. And I read in passing uh, where probably a young scholar had attributed the, uh, the phrase changing saying uh, to Deborah McDowell. I have all the respect in the world. And there were some other terms that another scholar had attributed to some other people. And I thought about the virtual disappearance of what I guess you would call, for the lack of a better term, the resistance tradition or the left in African American uh, cultural studies. You know, that, that was a vibrant part of African American culture and intellectual culture. Uh, there's always been diversity, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later on. But uh, we really don't have that, uh, you know, you know, prominent or in any substantive sort of way, um, you know, today, and how uh, people like Baraka, you know, in, in certain terms or uh, books, but uh, a lot of his ideas really have been erased. And so uh, this was the last of the introduction. I did a whole litany of different uh, terms, phrases that he uh, made uh, and, and counted the years before other people who had titles had made them, and it culminated with uh, what I'm calling uh, the Poetics of Black Biography uh, for Amiri Baraka uh, at uh, 75. Ask me where we're going, and I'll tell you where he's been. A moonwalk migration on a night train back to Newark, a southern journey back uptown, like Philadelphia, Mississippi. The Delta leads straight to the Bronx by way of Chicago, Memphis, or Tallahassee. From Howling Wolf to T-Pain, Ludacris, and the crazy blues of Mamie Smith, Sun House, and Sun Ra too. Electric boogie, black ballads and beatboxing, double quartet, jazz, jerking jitterbug, and finally the fly. The ascension into spirit, a Wednesday night prayer meeting, or the club rendered crunk the funk and frenzy as the boys called it hand claps and finger snaps. Freestyle, poetry, and turntable scratches, tremolos, bent notes, and breaks, choreographic torso shakes. It is a tale of screamers dancing in the street, a black magic mixtape of laughter and pain, of dry bones and hurricanes, of shine and the hungry sharks swimming in the deep blue sea, of meters and miles and minis and miracles, of bluebirds and blackbirds and yard birds too, of barbecue picnics and white lightning, of beatings and lynchings and smokestack lightning, of two steps and half steps, of cat cake walks and spake walks and walking it out, of high balls and rum balls and speed balls and fast balls, of prancers and dancers 
ball in the jack, of jump rhythms and cross rhythms and crossroads and polyrhythms, of bright cars and bright moments, of iron bars and stolen moments, of quest loves and found loves and old loves and new loves, of singers walking in shadows, of poets searching for light, of men sleeping in hollow logs and women kissing the sky. <laughs>
Vermeer Verden's pieces that were done in the collection at um, Austin's Museum of, Ver of uh, Modern Art and based on the photographs, since I'll be talking a lot about photographs on Wednesday, and you all will be looking a lot at photographs on Wednesday. Um, so it's also based on a photograph of Vermeer Verden. Dear Romy, you turned it out into out course, jazz and jam and slamming at the Savoy. One, first you turn it and us out. You chorus the chaos of Harlem nightlife into day clear, day clean wonder with your geometric precision. You took the tenements of those thin gin black lives and made them thick. Cut and snip and glue and gesso the layers of a beautiful brown woman's stare until we stare back. We wonder, we marvel at her and its vicious viscosity. Does she cut her cutout eyes and we who see? Is she coquette or carmine lipped conqueror? No, now we look again, revisit the canvas and see in her her tropic flower flourishing beneath the lamp of your work, your work shop. Two. Dear Mr. Bearden, with your revered Romare hands, you carve, then curse it, your name beneath a baptismal fire by water. Color, collect, and telegraph our train wrecked lives into something salvaged, worked into a magic, a healing balm, a blues. Three. Blues and jazz are words that leap from the pink canvas of the tongues of the hip or the hep as Langston Hughes might have it, cats that you have cut, collaged, and canvassed. Four, my favorite photo of you, you who stitched the quilted blues of the blazer you sport. Lapels lap over and away from the aqua turtle neck. Your black face wears a pink and beige, thin-lipped, almost smile, as if to say, shh, I don't just make Mysteries, I am Mysterioso, like Monk, behind the locked door of my sanctuary, my studio. Dear Mr. Bearden, you, who made our eyes jagged and jagged edges, here in this photo you are clean, not as a whistle, but as a train, wheel, shade, for all your geometries, equations, and exponentials, your face and jowls and teeth and guts around as a plate before it is cut into the cool canvas of a cordial coffee table gallery. Dear Mr. Bearden, your etchings have me itching for a cure, a salve from all those hexagonic, sweet and sour midnight faces that hex and haunt me still. Thank you. So I want to put this first poem right inside of Brother Yao's poem. Because he said, there's no such thing as a white girl. There's no such thing as a black boy. But I want to tell you, there is such a thing as a black girl. I've got proof. <laughs> Sushi my watermelon. What does it mean to be black? My students blink. To be black is an accident of nature, isn't it? A matter of melanin and Madame Hurston measuring foreheads and jawbones. To be black is a natural fact, isn't it? A matter of funk and funky beats and cool poses and style po points, Bootsy and Coltrane and my favorite foods, yes. collars and cornbread and sushi, watermelon. <laughs> Malcolm, Martin, and Harriet. Jay-Z is black, isn't he? <laughs> is, Su is Snoop? Don't ask. <laughs> to be black is a history, isn't it? Jim Crow and Nigga Jim and Jim Beam and Jimmy My Door, Take My TV. <laughs> Reincarnations of Mammy, right? The absence of light and enlightenment and metaphors of lack, isn't that right? A list of firsts. To be black is the problem of the 21st century, being so free of contexts, 
your Mason Dixon and red lines and colored people toting paper bags looking for the color line and the back of the line and the black of the line and the end of the line, the end of blackness. To be black is Nina Simone yelling peaches in a crowded ear. And Langston, Jacques, black colleges ain't black enough. Black talk <laughs> is black judgment, says Nikki. To be black is always a question of your sanity. Claim it. To be black is locating the blues, finding out it is not the bruise, the blackened eye of America's domestic violence narrative. Audre Lorde knew that black is unicorn, its legs portal to mythic be beginnings. Black is coal, the total black, breaking open into flame. Justice, justice, burning bright, is diamond to glass, is total word. I mean, I say, what does it mean to be? in the middle of a conversation that Frank X and I just had moments ago where he said the machine always wins, meaning if we don't assert our humanity, the machines will take over and dictate. So this is a poem that I thought about when I encountered a black woman who had bought herself some colored contact lenses the color of gold. So when she looked at you, her eyes were gold. <laughs> so this is called the President's Day Sale. <laughs> the last act of this 400 year tragedy is that thing I find in your eyes, that thing, that nothing waiting for me, that emptying out as I lay my secrets before you on the conveyor belt at the Walmart. I could go to the self-check aisle, conceal from you the three for $9.99 cellophane of panties, cotton, marked down 20% by the smiley-faced yellow bouncing ball in honor of our founding father, so-called, because they found us shirking modernity in the dark continent, time on our hands, you know, and asked us if we'd like to participate in America's first job trainings program, and we agreed and booked a middle passage right up to your checkout domain. To you, regal in your global garb, blue and gold, and your own accessorizing amber contact lenses. But I've got vegetables. This is super Walmart. <laughs> <laughs> and collards are always a hassle at the self-check. I lay cheap drawers before you on your conveyor belt and collars and vaginal lubricant, a Three Musketeers bar, a pint of Jerry Garcia, so many privacies barcoded to the National Data Center. When my 20% discount makes a no-show, you flick your eerie golden eyes, gold is the bouncing ball, but unsmiling, dangle my sweatshop, slave-made panties languorously aloft to inquire, are these marked down? She say they marked down. <laughs> And for women like us to look askance and forget our oceans, our suns, our pain of secrets we used to share in a single glance. <laughs>
between sisters. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.